All right, in this particular video, I want to go over the, the pituitary gland, which is more or less the central hub of the endocrine system, the pituitary gland along with the hypothalamus. So, um, you know, this is going to be a very important video for you if you're just getting into the endocrine system because the pituitary gland also is nicknamed the master gland, and you'll learn why, not in this video, but in the next video, why that is. Um, but in this video, what I want to focus primarily on is the functional anatomy of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus, and essentially how the pituitary gland is regulated by the hypothalamus, all right? And then in the next video, I'll get into the hormones and their various physiologic functions on our body. Um, you know, and again, a big reason why the pituitary gland is called the master gland is not necessarily because of its design, but because of the role that it plays with the endocrine system. The pituitary gland not only regulates, I mean, what it does is it regulates the activity of you know, with the help of the nervous system, it regulates the activity of all the major glands of the body, you know, such as the thyroid, the adrenal glands, the gonads, and so on. All right. So those glands don't function alone. But again, remember, uh, you know, prior to watching this video, you should watch the endocrine system physiology video that I made. But bear in mind that the nervous system does not work, or I'm sorry, the endocrine system does not work alone. It needs the help of the nervous system. And, um, and that's where the hypothalamus comes in. All right. So let's, uh, let's get rolling on this. So the pituitary gland, its location in the brain, this here is a dissected sheep brain. Um, I know the picture is a little fuzzy here, but, you know, essentially with this image, uh, you've got the, you know, if you want to remember your parts of the brain, you've got the cerebrum here. Here would be your corpus callosum. Here's your cerebellum. This would be your medulla, pons, and midbrain. And, you know, then you've got your thalamus. Uh, here would be about where the... Um, where an object called the optic chiasm is located. All right, now that's an important structure to remember. You know, whenever I teach this class, um, you know, I always, and especially when I get into neuroanatomy, I always emphasize the importance of the optic chiasm just because some of the most important parts of the human body, you know, not just the brain, but of the body, are located around this landmark. Okay, so here, what we're looking at here is a sheep brain still encased in the meninges, but you can see. Um, the pituitary gland and the optic chiasm right here. All right, so here is the optic chiasm. Now remember the word chiasm, or often chiasma, you'll see it written, basically means crossing. All right, so this essentially are where the optic, this is the location where the optic nerves, so here are your eyeballs, and here are your optic nerves, they cross each other. Um, on their way on their way to the occipital lobe for visual uh, for you know interpreting images all right so this landmark is important because right here you can see the pituitary gland all right so the pituitary gland would be just caudal or posterior to the optic chiasm okay it's right behind there all right, and as you can see, it's also inferior. It's, which you'll see in some other images in a second here, it's a, it hangs a little bit below. All right, and then this is also important because an area of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is a part of what's called your diencephalon, okay, is also located just above here, surrounding the, the, an area called the third ventricle. Okay, so you've got your hypothalamus covering some area you know, above the, around the third ventricle, around the, um, around the optic chiasm, which is right near the pituitary gland. So that's still a very, very important landmark to pay attention to. And here's an anterior view. You can see that these are the optic nerves, you know, heading towards that, that crossing point called the chiasm. And then you can see the pituitary gland suspended just below. Again, this is encased within the meninges, as you can see here. You can see the dura mater around the outside. These are the olfactory bulbs. Okay. And then here, boy, that picture's kind of blurry. Here, this is where the, op where the optic nerves cross. You know, the um, meninges were dissected off. And then this is where the pituitary gland used to be. 
All right. And the pituitary gland, you no, know, normally, so once they removed the meninges and took this off, they, we lost a couple of parts. We not only lost the pituitary, we lost the stalk called the infundibulum that the pituitary normally is suspended from. Okay. But again, you know, you know, I'm doing this just to, you know, illustrate the importance. Okay, my eraser's going crazy on me. To illustrate the importance um, of the location of that optic chiasm. Okay, so here you've got the chiasm. This is where the pituitary is normally located. So, you know, so let's think about this, for example. You know, people can develop pituitary tumors, all right? So if someone develops a pituitary tumor, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think one of the signs, what do you think one of the signs might be? Obviously, besides headaches, you, well, that would be more of a symptom, but, you know, there may be some kind of visual disturbances. Okay, you know, some kind of, some kind of disruption in your vision. Okay, you know, aside from headaches and other and, and, and other endocrine complications that are going to come with this. All right, so that's something to keep in mind. So you've got your optic chiasm, you've got the pituitary gland, and the bone that the pituitary gland is sitting in is called the sphenoid bone. Okay, the sphenoid bone, this butterfly-shaped bone that is located within the cranial vault. All right, and then it's broken down into a greater wing and lesser wing, and then this area right here is called the cella tersica. The cella tersica, which means Turkish, you know, Turkish saddle. Well, it doesn't mean that, but that's his nickname. Cella tersica. It's called a Turkish saddle because I don't know if you guys have ever seen a, an image of a, a, a Turkish saddles, but they're very curved like so, you know, when they sit in them. So, um, so right here, this is where the pituitary gland sits within that, within that, uh, Within that cell of Tersica, you know, some of your books may also have this area called the, um, I don't know, the hypophyseal sulcus. I've seen that before. Um, you know, I personally just would rather go with cell of Tersica. That's the more common term for it. All right. So if we take a look at this right here, so let's kind of imagine that the brain, okay, is sitting around here like so. And then you've got the, and then you've got the hypothalamus right about here. Okay. And then suspended from the hypothalamus would be the posterior part of the pituitary. And then you've got the anterior pituitary. Okay. So the pituitary gland, you know, I haven't gotten into this yet, but I'm going to, is broken down into two parts. Okay, essentially, you know, the basic books will say this has an, that the pituitary gland is made up of an anterior and a posterior lobe. Okay, and, um, you know, so this, the blue would be the anterior lobe. And the green would be the posterior lobe, which we'll talk more about in depth in a second here. All right, but again, you kind of get the picture of how that gland is positioned within, um, you know, within the brain here. Now, bear in mind, this is also makes it a very difficult area to operate on as well for surgical purposes because you have to remember all around here, you know, this is all frontal lobe. Okay, here you would have your temporal lobe. Here would be your occipital. And then up here would be your parietal. Okay, your parietal lobe. All right. And then underneath, you know, you would have, you know, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and so on. So you can't obviously just cut down into here if there's a tumor because, you know, you, you guys know how this works. You know, brain damage is irreversible. All right, you can't go in just from the front. You can't come in from the back. All right, plus you got to remember there's a, there's a major cluster of arteries around this area as well called the circle of Willis where major arteries of the brain meet so that also makes it a difficult area to operate on so essentially what they have to do when they operate on this area you know one of the main things they have to do is come up through the sinuses of the facial bones and through the sphenoid bone and then operate on the two on, on the pituitary gland like so from here
So again, its anatomic location is good because it's very well protected, but at the same time, if we actually need to access it, you know, it's a difficult area to get to. Okay, so again, just imagine, you know, you know how the pituitary gland is sitting right within this, you know, cella tersca of the sphenoid bone here. Not an easy area to access. All right. And then here, what structure is this? Just a little for a little review. That would be your... Foramen magnum, you know, the foramen or foramina is an opening in a bone. And then magnum means, you know, large. Okay, magnum means large. So that's the biggest, that's essentially the largest foramen in the body. That's where the spinal cord meets up with the brain stem. And, you know, so that's where neural pathways exit and enter the brain. Okay, so keep this in mind, you know, this anatomic location of the pituitary gland. And, you know, and again, I hope while you're watching this, you also have, you know, your books open and you're looking at this in your textbooks. I'm just showing you images that I'm coming up with. I'm trying to be creative and coming up with. So, you know, again, have your books out with you, you know, while you're taking a look at this as well, whether it's a gross anatomy book, your anatomy and physiology book, your physiology book, whatever it may be. Okay. Now, when it comes to... Understanding the, pituit the, the pituitary gland, you have to understand that it is, you know, it's regulated differently because of how it develops, okay? There are, remember, there are two lobes. There's a neurohypothesis, and there is, or, which is the posterior lobe, and then there's what's called the adenohypothesis, which is the posterior lobe. So, neurohypothesis, okay? otherwise known as the posterior lobe, and then the adenohypothesis, otherwise known as the anterior lobe. Okay, and the word hypothesis, that essentially means the pituitary gland. Okay, that's the term, that's a specific term for the pituitary gland itself the hypothesis. All right. Now, both of these lobes do not originate and develop within the brain. Okay. They develop in separate areas and they wind up joining together during embryonic development. All right. And as a result, now, that, now that's important. That's an important concept to keep in the back of your mind because this means that they're also, that both of these lobes, they not only produce different hormones, they're regulated differently as well. All right. So being that, so, and, and the reason why they're regulated differently is because one lobe originates in the brain, one originates in the, in the upper pharynx. Okay. So let's take a look at this. So during embryonic development, what you can see here, is as we're as we're watching the essentially the development of the central nervous system, what we have is basically we're developing, you know, this is what's called the diencephalon. Okay, remember the diencephalon would be your hypothalamus and thalamus. Okay, your hypothalamus and your thalamus. All right, so, and then here, all right, then here we've got what's called the foregut, and then the notochord, all right. Now, what this area is right here, this is a downgrowth of the hypothalamus, this is essentially a downgrowth of the hypothalamus. Okay, and that downgrowth is essentially the beginning of the posterior lobe, the neural hypothesis. Okay, so essentially the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland is, a, is basically a downgrowth of the diencephalon, is essentially a downgrowth of the hypothalamus. Okay, now what happens with the anterior lobe is that again as i mentioned before its development begins within um essentially within the throat all right so what's happening then as we're as we're starting to as the pharynx is developing all right the 
the the membranes of the pharynx as as you can see as the as the as the the brain is developing and the telencephalon is developing as well the structures are folding in on themselves all right and what winds up happening is as these membranes start to fold in on themselves what you form is this structure called Rathke's pouch Okay, so this area right here, so this area of cells, Rathke's pouch, this is what's going to eventually become the anterior pituitary gland. And you can start to see what's going to happen here is as, as, we start, as we start to fold inward, as the head starts to kind of fold forward like so, the neurohypothesis or the posterior lobe is going to wind up meeting up with Rathke's pouch here. And then what's going to happen as this phenoid bone starts to develop, Okay, then the sphenoid bone is going to start to develop around here, and then the you know the cells of the pouch are going to wind up bunk. They're gonna they're gonna make their home in the cella turcica here, and they're gonna fuse with the neurohypothesis. All right, and then as this as the bone starts to close off, this is you know form what's called the pharyngeal hypothesis, which really has no function in humans. It's just kind of a leftover remnants of this development. And then what you wind up having is you've got a finished off cella turcica, you've got the neurohypothesis, and you've got your adenohypothesis, your anterior lobe and your posterior lobe. All right. And then you've got your optic chiasm, because it's going to abbreviate this, your optic chiasm. And then these structures here called the pars tuberalis. All right, the pars tuberalis, which eventually becomes the infundibulum or the stalk of the pituitary gland. Okay, so what winds up happening then is the posterior lobe is fused, or essentially again is fully connected to the um, to the hypothalamus of the brain, and then the um, the anterior lobe essentially kind of hooks onto this pars tuberalis and then makes its home in the sphenoid bone right here. So now we've got a developed pituitary gland hanging out within the cell within the cella turcica of the sphenoid. Now, um, another term for this as well is the pars nervosa. So basically, once this downgrowth of diencephalon makes its way into the sphenoid bone, it, you know, you know, you can call it the pars nervosa, which will eventually become the posterior pituitary. Okay. Now, the reason why we talk about this is because, being that the posterior lobe, the of the pituitary, the neurohypothesis, and you can see why we call it the neurohypothesis, it originated from the central nervous system itself. Remember, this is just a downgrowth of the diencephalon or the hypothalamus. All right, and the anterior lobe, the adenohypothesis, is essentially a you know developed for in the pharynx and migrates its way into the brain. Okay, adeno hypothesis. Remember, adeno means gland. So this is closer to a true gland than the posterior lobe. I mean, being that it is derived of epithelial cells, and that's you know what made you know. And, and basically, if you try to stain, you know, from a histology perspective, and try to stain the anterior lobe, the dyes you would have to use to stain the anterior lobe are going to be dyes that you're going to have to use to stain epithelial cells. Okay. Because this, you know, this was a derivative of the mucus meal, the mucosa of the pharynx itself. All right, which you know is is epithelial tissue. All right. Now, being that these two originated, so even though they come together in the same area, they're, how they originated also plays a role in how the gland is regulated. Okay, it plays a very pivotal role in how the gland is regulated. Okay, and the neurohypothesis essentially is regulated by the hypothalamus itself okay the neurohypothesis of the posterior lobe is regulated by the hypothalamus itself all right so essentially what we have here now this here would be the optic chiasm okay the optic chiasm now <clears throat> 
I bring that up because remember the hypothalamus is a, is is just a cluster of centers that are responsible for regulating basically all aspects, well most aspects of our homeostasis. Okay, remember homeostasis is the term for balance. Okay, physiologic balance. All right. So the optic chiasm. So just above the optic chiasm, there's a center in the hypothalamus called the supra optic nuclei that contains receptors called osmoreceptors. Okay, osmoreceptors. So these neurons, so the neurons that are located within this area, all right, are essentially sensitive to changes in our in our body water level. And what they essentially do is they regulate what's called the osmolarity of our blood. These receptors are sensitive to changes in sodium levels. Okay, so essentially as our as we become more dehydrated and we lose water, basically we're going to become more concentrated with sodium. And that will excite these receptors. And basically what they'll do is these receptors have axons that project into the posterior lobe. So this would be the neurohypothesis, which you can see right here is a downgrowth of the hypothalamus right here. All right, so essentially these neurons, these supraoptic nuclei, they project right into the posterior lobe. So, when need be, so then when we're dehydrated, as these neurons become excited, that's going to stimulate the posterior lobe to release a hormone called ADH, otherwise known as antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. All right, and ADH is going to travel to your kidneys, and that stimulates your kidneys to retain water. Okay. So the supraoptic nuclei, and then here in this area, called the paraventricular nucleus, all right, again, same type of setup, all right, we've got neurons here that project right down into the posterior lobe. Okay, and these regulate the activity, all right, of another hormone called oxytocin. Okay, oxytocin, which is definitely, which is a hormone that's definitely more important in females than males. Oxytocin is basically used for uterine contraction. Okay, uterine contraction and also the ejection of milk. Okay, two very different scenarios, but a hormone that's important for regulating those processes. So essentially, you know, once the once the mother has, uh, you know, is getting laid in the intergestational period and the uterus is stretched to a certain capacity, there are neurons that are going to synapse with the brain. All right, and then what's going to happen is that's going to that's going to excite these you know this this you know this, the the neurons within this particular center, the paraventricular nucleus, and then the hormone oxytocin will be released, or secreted, and then oxytocin will travel through the bloodstream to the uterus, and then that will stimulate the smooth muscle of the uterus to contract, and that's a labor contraction. And then what's going to happen is, and then as you know that, you know, if, you've, if, if you're watching this and you've had children or if you know anybody that's been through this, that contractions get quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. They get the, the, the duration between contractions gets shorter and shorter and they become more forceful. That's because while the child is still within the uterus, that means there's going to be more and more oxytocin being released.
and as the oxytocin levels rise and the and the uterus continues to contract and there's more pressure being applied to it in the child oxytocin levels will go up and that's why labor contractions go from about 30 minutes apart to 30 seconds apart once it gets really close to time you know to the time of having the child all right and then as a result and then essentially once the child is birthed that's called partuition then the then the oxytocin levels will start to go will slowly start to go down you know there may be some residual contractions after birth but essentially as the pressure is relieved from the uterus and it starts to take on its normal size again oxytocin levels go down okay and then when it comes to oxytocin and um, breastfeeding, essentially there are two hormones. One of these hormones that is secreted from the anterior pituitary called prolactin. Prolactin stimulates milk production. So it stimulates the mammary glands to, to synthesize and produce milk. And then once the child starts to suckle on the nipple of the mother, that, again, very similar to, you know, like the uterus, you know, starts to basically starts to activate these, this area of the brain. Oxytocin, you know, this paraventricular nucleus. Oxytocin is released. And then that stimulates the, the release of milk from those glands. And that's why sometimes, you know, you know, when a mother is not ready to lactate or ready to lactate, ready to breastfeed, um, but she may hear a baby crying or something like that, and or in a situation like that, and all of a sudden she starts to to, to lact like she's in a restaurant and a baby, you know, she just had a child, but her and the her and the husband are out to eat, and a baby starts crying, and that motherly, you know, you, you know what we call the motherly instinct starts to kick in. Okay, basically that, that crying child is activating this center of the brain and then oxytocin is released and then she's going to lactate, obviously, when she doesn't want to be. Okay, so that can happen sometimes. So in a nutshell, you can see that the posterior pituitary is directly controlled by the hypothalamus itself. It's directly controlled to the central, by the central nervous system because it is a downgrowth of the, of the central nervous system, of that diencephalon. Okay, and then essentially what this area is here, these are hypothalamic nuclei that are responsible for basically, you know, uh, resp responding to stress. Okay, so these, so these nuclei would play a very big role in the fight or flight response, which we'll talk about later on when I talk about the physiology of stress and so on. All right, so essentially the posterior lobe of the pituitary is directly regulated by these two centers of the of the hypothalamus, okay, the paraventricular nuclei and the supraoptic nuclei. And also the hormones of the posterior pituitary are essentially produced in these areas, transported down here, and stored in these areas. So essentially when these neurons get excited, they, you know, they release their particular chemical message, their particular neurotransmitter that stimulates the release of these hormones into the bloodstream, and then they travel to their target tissue, okay? So that's how the posterior pituitary is regulated. Now the anterior pituitary is a little different, okay? This is regulated through what's called the portal system. I want to be specific, the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system hypothalamus pituitary now what a portal system is and there are there are there are plenty of portal systems in the human body a portal system is essentially two consecutive capillary beds okay so if you're a you know, we haven't gotten to the circulatory system yet, but if you're a student coming back and reviewing this material, bear in mind that, you know, normally when we talk about capillary beds, we talk about an art, you know, an arterial, a small artery, and then you've got one side of a capillary bed that has arterial blood flowing through it. You've got the other side that has venous blood, and then it hooks up to a venule. Okay, so you essentially got artery, capillaries, vein. All right, and then, and then on the arterial end of the capillary bed, 
the forces of blood flow through here favor a process called filtration. So basically, um, whatever is is in the blood on the arterial end of a capillary bed is pumped out into the tissues. And then the forces on the venous end of a capillary bed favor a process called absorption. Okay, reabsorption, I should say. Reabsorption. So whatever waste or junk or material that's in the tissues on the venous end of a capillary bed will be sucked back into the circulatory system. That's how nutrients and gases are exchanged between the blood and our tissues. Okay. Now, being that the anterior lobe is so now being that the anterior lobe is not directly connected to the nervous system itself, there has to be another way uh, that the that the brain controls the um, you know this this particular gland it's this part of the gland itself, and that's how it does it through this portal system. Okay, so what we have here is we've got so this would be the portal vein. Okay, that would be the portal vein. So this would be a capillary bed called the primary capillary plexus. All right, and then this would be the secondary capillary plexus. Okay, and so you put these, so you put these three together and now you have your portal system. So you've got one capillary bed, another capillary bed, the primary and secondary plexi or capillary beds, and then you've got this portal vein connecting the two together. Okay. And then here, this is what's called the superior hypophyseal artery. Okay, and you can do the math here. This would be the inferior. All right. This is called the trabecular artery. This essentially connects these two arteries together, which they are essentially out, you know, basically branches of the carotids. And then this is the capillary plexus of the posterior lobe. So just another capillary bed. Now, this is different because essentially this, you know, the blood, the blood being circulated into this capillary bed is blood that is just being circulated from the regular circulation. Okay, so you've got a combination of blood um, entering the posterior lobe, coming in from the inferior hypophyseal artery, and some collateral circulation from the trabecular artery connecting to the superior hypophyseal artery and then you've got this capillary plexus here this is just normal blood flow you know like any other area in the body supplying this particular tissue with blood and also this is important because remember capillaries are porous vessels they've got little holes in them okay so if we need to get the hormone remember we talked about the nerves that work their way into the posterior pituitary when these nerves for example stimulate the release of well from this from the paraventricular nucleus this would be oxytocin okay oxytocin will diffuse into the bloodstream in this capillary bed and then will circulate out through the through the venule or the venous end of the capillary bed and then travel to its target tissue Okay, so not only is this so not only is this important for just circulating blood, so this tissue can stay healthy. This is how the hormones get into the bloodstream as well. Remember, we talked about you know basic endocrinology in the first video, endocrine physiology. That that's how you know hormones work. They squirt out their hormones into their tissue, into their interstitial spaces, their tissue fluid spaces. The hormones diffuse into the bloodstream and then circulate to their target tissues. Okay, now. The hypothalamus does control the anterior pituitary, but not directly. Okay. Now, the, um, the, the, there are various cells of the anterior pituitary that are responsible for producing and secreting their respective hormones. Okay. And we'll talk more about these in the next video. But, for example, let's, uh, oh, I don't know, let's talk about a hormone called a, oh, I don't know, thyrotrope. Okay, so these are cells, these would be cells that are responsible for producing the hormone TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. 
All right. So let's say your thyroid hormone levels are down. You know, T3 and T4, which are, these hormones are essentially responsible for increasing your BMR, basal metabolic rate. Okay, remember BMR basically means the amount of calories you burn at rest. So right now, if you're watching this video, how many calories do you think you're burning? Because remember, your metabolism is like an idling engine. Okay, and we can increase our metabolic rate by, we would be like putting the foot on the gas. And one of the ways we can do it is by secreting these hormones. Okay, and you know, there are, there are areas, there are times during the day when we need to elevate our thyroid hormone levels. Like for example, after we eat a meal, we want to burn those calories that we just consume. Okay, so then what's going to happen is when, you know, when we need to release TSH, because remember, remember the, the, the pituitary gland regulates and controls the activities of the other major glands of the body. The thyroid gland needs the pituitary gland in order to activate it or um, allow it to do its job. So essentially what it's going to do is, the, is there will be hormones released from the hypothalamus into this first um, capillary plexus, the primary capillary plexus, okay, called, you know, thyrotropic releasing hormones, okay, and that's what essentially how this works, is the hypothalamus releases what are called releasing hormones into this primary capillary plexus, okay, and then these releasing hormones diffuse down into down through this portal vein into the secondary capillary plexus where they will then circulate out and then interact with their target cells. And then that will stimulate these thyrotropes to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which then diffuses back into this um, secondary capillary plexus and out of this portal vein, or I'm sorry, out of that venule and then into the bloodstream. You know, that, hypo, that hypophyseal vein is what it's called. Okay. And this works for all the other hormones as well. If we need to get our gonadotropin levels up, you know, the hormones that regulate the activity of the gonads. Okay. Um, GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormones, will be released. They'll diffuse down in uh, through this primary... Um, capillary bed through the portal vein into the into the anterior pituitary itself, and then these gonad and then the the gonadotropins will be released into the bloodstream. And then, if you're a male, that may they'll more or less be used to increase sperm production. If you're a female, depending on which gonadotropin it is, could either stimulate ovulation or the maturation of an egg, depending on where in your cycle you're at. Okay, so you get the picture here that this is how the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland is regulated through these releasing hormones. Okay, now there's a reason why this is so basically what you should be thinking about is that the hypothalamus is not is really is the master of the endocrine system. Because this controls all the activity of the of the pituitary gland. But why isn't the hypothalamus called the master gland? Well, hypothalamus is not a gland. It's a part of the brain. It's nervous tissue. Okay, it's nervous tissue. Now, now bear in mind the importance of all of this. Bear in mind the importance of all of this. You know by now, by, by the time you're getting to the endocrine system, that the hypothalamus, because you should have gone through the nervous system by now, that the hypothalamus is the part of the brain that regulates our homeostasis. But we've talked about this before, that we just don't have enough nerves to branch out to all cells of our body. If we need to do something like increase our basal metabolic rate, if we need to increase our caloric burn, we don't have enough nerves that, to branch out to specific tissues because, remember, nerves are precision-type cells, okay? They branch out to a specific little group of cells. They synapse with a specific area of a cell or a group of cells, and that increases or decreases the activity of that particular area of cells,
So the nervous system can't reach all cells of the body. But by controlling, by regulating the activity of the endocrine system, we can make some pretty significant changes because now we can squirt out a lot of little chemical messages into the bloodstream. These hormones can diffuse into our tissues and come in contact with far more cells than the nervous system possibly could on its own. So if we need to get our metabolic rate up, we release a hormone that increases the activity of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland cranks out all this thyroid hormone, and now our metabolism is up. Or sperm production goes up, or bones grow because of growth hormone, or so on. You get the picture. You know, and that's why oftentimes this, you know, the you know the, the nervous system and endocrine system are lumped together and called the neuroendocrine system. Okay, because of the, you can see right here the interrelationship between the two. All right, so that essentially is the functional anatomy of the pituitary gland. You know, again, I hope the embryology aspect of this lecture made sense. I mean, I don't, I, I don't like to try to pretend that I'm an embryologist by any means, but it is important to understand even the very, very basics of that process because, again, you know, you have to understand how both, oops, how both, um, how both lobes of these glands not only originate, but how they are regulated as well. All right. And uh, the next video then will be about the hormones of the pituitary gland and the functions they play. We've already introduced a couple of them in this video, but there's plenty more to talk about. I think that's it. Yep.